Perfect. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to this, our third debate of uh, Michaelmas term. Uh, we have eight more, so lots left for you to enjoy later on over the course of the term. Um, first things first, I'd like to thank our sponsors for tonight, OCNC. Uh, you should be able to see their promotion material around you. So if you've got any burning questions about that, hopefully the answers should be revealed on those pieces of paper. Um, the motion before the House this evening is, this House believes Oxbridge has failed Britain. And I think we've got quite an interesting lineup of different voices in to talk on that subject. A few ground rules. Again, this is always on the back of your order paper, um, but I'll just lay it out for you quickly to start. So um, the format is the same as it always is, which is uh, three uh, speeches on both sides, alternating pairs of speeches. So John will stand up and make a speech uh, for 10 minutes or, or less on the uh, proposition. Bobby will stand up and make one uh, on the opposition, and then we'll go to a round of floor speeches. And if I could ask you to say your name and your college uh, for the record, when we go to those floor speeches, that'd be incredible. You also have the right to interrupt and intervene during the speeches themselves. So I, I really would encourage you to do that, but stand up and say on that point. And um, if, if you do make a point or if you do speak from the floor at any point, you are of course welcome to the post dinner drinks reception. So that's an incentive for you all. So without further ado, we'll crack on with the main debate. You've heard enough of me speaking. Um, and we're going to start with John Elledge uh, on the proposition. John Elledge is the editor of City Metric and a prominent commentator on politics, public life, and history, writing in the New Statesman. He matriculated at Trinity Hall in 1999. John, the floor is yours. <laughs> Before we walked in, you asked me if I had any questions, and I forgot to ask a rather vital one, which is, where am I meant, where am I meant to be standing exactly? Um, you can stand there for Excellent. wherever. Um, so yeah, it's very nice to be here. I, uh, I never spoke at the Union when I was an undergraduate. I came once for drinks in my Freshers' Week, uh, and had a nice enough time, spent a long time chatting to a girl in the bar, and afterwards I said, oh, do you want to maybe go out sometime? And she just went, no, oh, no. <laughs> And so I never came back. But that was 19 years ago, so I'm, I'm almost over it. Um, it does mean I've not really done much of the sort of formal debate. I'm a bit of a keyboard warrior by profession. Uh, and also by profession, I'm a bit of an awkward sod. So my first instinct is to start immediately questioning the premise of the question I meant to be arguing. Um, this house believes Oxbridge has failed Britain, is the premise. Well, failed how? Is, is Oxbridge meant to serve Britain? Does it serve the world? Is it serving the cause of education or the cause of knowledge? There's, there's a lot to unpack here. I'm going to try not to derail this whole thing before we even get started. But my instinct is that the problem isn't really Oxbridge itself. I think there is a problem, but I think it's actually the relationship between Oxbridge and the British establishment rather than the actual sort of institutional structures we're, we're all inside right now. I think the relationship between Oxbridge and how the British state works, though, is deeply problematic, and I think it might be going to get us all killed. Um, I have three main points. I'm not sure I'm going to last the full ten minutes, but the three main points. Firstly, uh, a broad philosophical point, a diversity of points of view is, in life, the good thing. And our obsession with two particular universities, with, let's face it, quite similar teaching styles, quite similar outlooks on life, means that we don't necessarily have it. One of the best arguments against letting a series of identical white men in grey suits run everything is that they are more likely to think in similar ways to each other. And that means they miss stuff. They might miss opportunities. They might miss risks. So the field I know best at the moment is the one I write about, which is cities, the urban landscape. Cities, the bits of cities designed by men, which to a large extent, they tend to be. They, the men who design these spaces are unlikely to think about how they may feel to a mother with a pushchair, or, to, or whether they feel safe for a woman walking on her own at night. And these are quite vital things when you're designing a piece of public space. And because the architecture profession is still overwhelmingly male, 
a lot of the public spaces that are popping out at the other end are not necessarily fit for purpose. Diverse, a diverse group of architects will probably do that job better. And you know, we can, we can take this principle a bit further. In, there's a principle in psychology called cognitive diversity. If you look at the team at Bletchley Park in World War II, they had mathematicians, they had linguists, they had classicists. They were all approaching the problem in different ways, and they cracked it. I'm not certain that an establishment dominated by Oxbridge is necessarily going to have that cognitive diversity. The upper echelons of business and politics recruit very heavily from these two institutions, which both, as I said, teach in a very similar way. And I think the danger is that even if you end up with a diversity of gender or race or sexuality, you won't have that cognitive diversity. Our leaders might think the same way. And at that point, it doesn't matter how clever they are, they're still going to have groupthink. And groupthink makes you stupid. Point number two, our national obsession with Oxbridge, I think, means that we tend to underrate other universities. And that also kind of means we let them off the hook sometimes. Um, looking around, I very much doubt there are many people in the room who are old enough to remember the Laura Spence affair. That was uh, May of the year 2000. She was a state school girl from, from Tyneside. She got five A's at A-level, applied to study medicine at Magdalen College, Oxford, got rejected because you know, most people who apply for that course that year did get rejected. The only thing that was different about Laura Spence is that at that year's TUC conference, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, took it upon himself to weigh in on this debate. And the result was months, literally months. This started in May, it was still rumbling on in October. The entire public sphere was dedicated to the question of this one particular girl's UCAS form. Um, and it strikes me as absolutely absurd. And while we're here, doesn't it, doesn't it just sound like a much nicer world where we could spend five months arguing about university admissions rather than Brexit? But that's a whole different thing. Um, my point is that from, from the, the whole nature of that debate assumed that there were only two universities in this country that it was worth getting into. And no offense to you fine people, but that's nonsense. On most measures, Britain has, I think, the second best higher education system in the world. If you look at this year's QS rankings in the top 10 in the world, there are actually four universities in Britain that make the top 10. There's Oxford and Cambridge, but there's also Imperial College and UCL. If you go down the top 50, there's another four. That's eight universities in the top 50. The US is ahead of that, but no other country is even close to that record. But by talking as if only these two ancient universities matter, we are totally ignoring the achievements of these others. Not only that, but there's an obsession with Oxbridge entry sort of reinforces the idea that it's a world apart. I think there's a danger that sort of talking endlessly about how like Oxbridge admissions is difficult, it, it might put people off, make it sound like a sort of a strange world where you know people dress up in black tie for a laugh, uh, rather than the kind of place that should be open to people. Um, you know. But also, as I say, it lets other universities off the hook. If you look at the sort of state school admission figures, Imperial, UC, UCL, Edinburgh, Bristol, these are all top-rated universities. They are all within a couple of points of Oxbridge on state school admission. None of them are doing substantially better. And we don't talk about that. When did you last hear about the access problem at Edinburgh, for example? So I think our national obsession with what happens here and in Oxford is damaging the university system generally and making it harder to solve problems that it faces in the round, not just at these two universities. Please, sir. Richard Barton, Street of College. Um, what exactly does a national obsession with Oxford or Cambridge have to do with whether Oxford and Cambridge themselves are failing the nation? Well, that's an excellent point, which is why, if you notice at the very beginning of my speech, I slightly tried to wriggle out of it by changing the meaning of the question to one I would rather answer. <laughs> I'm sure that such a terrible act has never before been performed on these floors, so I can only apologize. Um, but I will, if you don't mind, complete my speech. This one that you will be pleased to hear is much more specifically about Oxbridge and how it works as opposed to its relationship with the broader world. The Oxbridge teaching system, supervisions here, tutorials in Oxford, they tend to teach a particular skill. They teach you to cram vast amounts of information very quickly and then regurgitate it in a brief, compelling way. I know science courses are a little bit different, but essentially Oxbridge arts and social science degrees are teaching you to be extremely good at bullshitting. 
And that's especially true of one particular degree course, not one here, the PPE course at Oxford, from which an enormous number of politicians are drawn. Well, they cover so much ground so quickly, it teaches breadth and not depth. It teaches you to blag. Now, this is basically the same sort of skill set you need to be a newspaper columnist. So it's been great prep for my job. Um, but the problem is, because the British establishment is dominated by products of Oxbridge and as well by newspaper columnists, we tend to talk as if this is the same skill set as intelligence or ability or depth of knowledge. And it's not. It's something completely different. For the last couple of decades, at least, the British government has been run by people who are extremely good at making compelling arguments in that kind of supervision format, or in a 700-word column in the Telegraph, or on the floor of the Cambridge Union, and that's not the same as being right. That's not the same as knowing what you talk about. So this, I think, is how we ended up with David Cameron, who was called the SA Crisis Prime Minister, because he would try and cram everything through at the last minute, assume he could muddle through. And to be fair, that worked for him exceptionally well. Until on June the 23rd, 2016, it worked for him exceptionally badly. It's how we ended up with Brexit, brought about by a group of people who have never bothered to learn what the customs union is, or how the single market works, or what any of those boring institutions in Brussels do. They just decided they were bad, and that was enough. It means that we are interested, the, the national debate, we're interested in horse races rather than policy. We're interested in knockabout rather than substantive debate. And it brought us Michael Gove saying that people were sick of experts. It is perversely, the Oxbridge approach to these things is strangely anti-intellectual. So I think our national obsession with Oxbridge has led to groupthink in public life. I think it means we neglect the other universities in the, it, that are very good. For, for good and ill, we let them off the hook. We also ignore their successes. But worst of all, Oxbridge gave us Boris Johnson. <laughs> and if that isn't damning, I don't know what is. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for those opening remarks. Um, we move on now to our first speaker for the opposition. Um, Bobby Seagull is a maths teacher, television personality, and university challenge semi-finalist. He has recently launched a television series with rival quizzer Eric Monkman, who some of you might remember. Both of them did a wonderful pub quiz this time last week, 11 months ago, I believe. Uh, he matriculated at Lady Margaret Hall, Oxford in 2003 at Hughes Hall, Cambridge in 2014, and at Emmanuel College, Cambridge in 2015, the college he decided eventually to uh, represent on University Challenge. Bobby, the floor is yours. So I've never seen lots of people pouring, uh, watching me pour water. But... I'm a mathematician, so I've got to get a timer to do it all. Okay. <laughs> Method acting. <laughs> Mr. Seagull, Mr. Seagull. Go on. Mr. Seagull, sir, I went in the summer school to Cambridge, and that place is Peng, proper Peng. <laughs> I reckon I could go there. Why not? You know me, Mr. Seagull. I grew up in a council estate in East Ham only 15 minutes from our school, and I did it. Why not you? Oxbridge raises aspirations. I'm a school maths teacher in an inner city state school in the London borough of Newham. And this is a typical conversation I have with students every single week. Let there be no doubt, I'm not here today to tell you that Oxbridge is perfect or that everything is working as everyone in Britain wants it to be. Far from it. But we must not make the school kid mistake of attributing Britain's inequality in education to Oxbridge or other issues. The problem starts far, far before a student even thinks about applying to uni. This debate is not this house believes that Oxbridge should do more, or this house believes that Oxbridge should reflect its population more accurately. 
These would be more straightforward and touristic debates, and I'm willing to do this at the Eagle, where DNA was discovered, or those who prefer the sweaty surroundings of uh, uh, the Regal, known as Spoons, I'm willing to have a chat about it there as well. Let's not use Oxbridge as a scapegoat for the continuous and historical failure of governments in education policy. Underfunding of state schools, underfunding of mental health services, underfunding for teacher training. But this debate is more than that for me. First, does Oxbridge represent the best aspirations that we as a society can give to our children? And second, does Oxbridge represent the best message that Britain can send out to the rest of the earth that we are world class? When I demonstrate this, we will not be in a position to argue that Oxbridge has failed Britain. The very existence of Oxbridge in this country serves as a point of reference for aspiration for young people. Not every child will make Oxbridge, but that's to miss the point. By having these lofty goals, school students, parents, teachers like me, communities do everything they can to give their children the best opportunities. On my train journey to Cambridge from King's Cross, I was listening to some uh, music from Stormzy, and for those who don't know, Stormzy's a very, very popular rapper. Um, at the Brit Awards, Stormzy criticized our current prime minister. Sometimes people conflate individual politicians like Boris Johnson and their perceived failings with the whole of Oxbridge. But this is a false conflation. So what did Stormzy do? Whilst critical of government policy, he has given a nod to the power of Oxbridge as an aspirational tool through his actions. He has set up the Stormzy Scholarship to Cambridge, which will fund two black students who are British to go here. He could have chosen any university in the UK, but he chose an Oxbridge University. In fact, our very own Cambridge. Why? Because Stormzy realizes the power of aspirations. In Stormzy's own words, it's so important for black students, especially to be aware that it can 100% be an option to attend a university of this caliber. And if someone in this room thinks that Oxbridge doesn't represent aspirations, I'll quote some Stormzy lyrics back to them, and I'll say, I would tell my man, shut up, you're way too big for your boots. <laughs> Being a math teacher, I can't go through an entire speech without some use of numbers. Go ahead. Dhruv Korshik, Trinity Hall. Um, this is all well and good that you know Oxbridge gives our students this amazing ideal to aspire to. When some of them do get there, it is the experience of a lifetime, and I'm sure we're all aware of our privilege to be here. But don't you think for those who don't manage to get here, who labour very hard, and due to whatever you know form of unluckiness or you know misfortune, don't end up here, that this is such an you know unhealthy thing to be making our young people aspire to? Because at the, in the end, there are so many better, or so many equally good places to be, which really are being ignored, and people are feeling really bad that they don't get to make. Is, is this not unhealthy in your in your view? Thank you, great question. I would say from my experience of being a slightly older, mature graduate, I've had friends that didn't get into Oxbridge, and of course that when you're 16 or 17 it hurts a bit, but they get over it. Again, the real world is competitive, and we mustn't mollycoddle our young people into thinking the real world isn't like that. So, a quick survey first of all. Hands up here who's a fan of Love Island. Anyone, anyone? Come on, more hands than that, more hands. Good, good. Well, I, I'm clearly, Good, that's, that's, that's good, maybe at 40%. Well, I'm a huge fan, and this year's winners, Jack and Danny, if you know, you know, amazeballs, amazeballs. So, despite being a fan of Love Island, it's a tragedy that we live in a country where more than twice as many people applied for Love Island compared to Oxbridge undergraduate applications. That's startling. Think about this, 85,000 people applied for those 12 spots on Love Island and 37,000 applied for Oxbridge undergraduate last year. Mind-blowing. So in this environment, having Oxbridge as an aspirational goal and putting it up there as the power of the mind on a platform is indeed worthy. We only have to look further at Oxbridge entry data to see that this aspiration is starting to be delivered more widely, perhaps not quickly enough, though. In a decade, the proportion of state sector entrants 
at Cambridge has risen from about 54% to 62%. And Oxford, likewise, over the past couple of decades, has gone up from 48% state to 60%. Further, admissions tutors at Cambridge use contextual data, such as the school's success rate at Oxbridge, uh, to give the fullest possible picture of the applicant. Right now, my understanding is that the corporate world doesn't do this to the same extent. So by comparison, Oxbridge is actually leading the way and making strides to make sure that more of this aspiration is available to more of us. So I like university challenge, so I couldn't pass through without a quick start of the 10 questions. So perhaps have a listen here. So my best Jeremy Paxman quiz master voice. Which poet's words, again, put your hand up if you know this. Which poet's words in his 1855 collection were, a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's the heaven for? Anyone? What, did I hear something? Um, Ten points. <laughs> Ten points, yeah. So Oxbridge isn't heaven. Well, the van of life for kebabs might be after a night out, but Browning's words remind us that Oxbridge serves as an aspiration for us all. When people think of Britain, we think of Wimbledon, Shakespeare, the Queen, Adele, hello, um, queuing, West Ham Football Club, well, maybe not West Ham Football Club, um, the weather, and Oxbridge. Oxbridge is a world-class academic institution, producing research that changes the way we think and live in Britain and in the world. We cannot think about Oxbridge only in the bubble of Britain, but within the context of the world. Let's look at other countries, the Ivy League of America, the Institutes of Technology in India. These countries do not stigmatize their leading institutions the way we do, because they seem to better appreciate their benefits. So the question is, what does Oxbridge do? Again, a bit of quick bit of, I was going to say Googling, but a, a sort of anonymous search engine uh, tells me that um, it says the research underpins at Cambridge a huge range of innovations which create prosperity, improve quality of life, protect the environment, and enrich our culture. Institutions that do this are not failing Britain, or indeed the world. Oxbridge is a living, breathing institution where more recent scientific projects have improved the efficiency of water treatments. And historically, we've had discoveries like pulsars by Jocelyn Bell in the 60s. Beyond the science, Oxbridge is a huge hub for social entrepreneurs and innovation. Hands up, we went to Freshers Fair last week. A few, quite a few, yeah? So again, I looked at the list of organizations there, and they're so socially minded. We have things like the Human Rights Law Society and the Eco Racing Society. You go to College JCRs, or I'm an MCR, I'm the current accommodation officer, the best one in Cambridge, <laughs> you may find students who care about the world, its people, and its environment. Oxbridge produces people who want to make a difference. In 2012, a 15-year-old girl from Pakistan was shot in the head. Her crime, only to have spoken up for the rights of girls. And who is this girl? All of us know. M Malala. After her recovery and winning a Nobel Peace Prize at the age of 17, she went to university. Malala could have gone anywhere in the world. But where did she choose? Oxbridge, of course. She went to Oxford. Because she realizes the power that an Oxbridge background has to help her further her goals for improving education and equality. Cast your mind back to my student who used the word peng, and yep, it is, it is a word that my student used. He's one dreaming of going to Oxbridge. But his story is not unique. There are countless of other people out there across the country with the same story. I didn't come here today to tell you that everything is perfect with Oxbridge. Despite its flaws, it's an institution making an impact, producing people and research that changes the way that Britain and the world thinks and lives. With my Mr. Seagull teacher hat on, I'm proud to go back to my students and tell them they should aim high, and if they want to make a difference to the world, Oxbridge is not a bad place for them to start.
Thank you very much uh, for that. Bobby, we move on now to a round of floor speeches. So if anyone wants to speak in proposition of the motion, keep your hand up. Perfect. Um, just wait for a microphone to get round to you from the back there. Cheers. Uh, Ellie Wood from Newnham College. Um, I'll try and keep this brief. Yes, we are very privileged to be students at this university, but I find that there's still a problem with the fact that there's a, a sort of quite a big narrative around the fact that if you're coming from an underrepresented background, you've kind of escaped that to get here. Um, you know, it's not as black and white as state versus independent. It doesn't show the whole picture, um, particularly when you take into account selective schools like grammar schools. Um, you know, the university is still taking over 80% of its student intake from the top two social groups. Um, the Sutton Trust report has shown that five schools sent as many students to Oxbridge as 1,800 secondary schools in this country. Um, students at independent schools have a 1 in 20 chance of getting to Oxbridge. Students on free school meals, 1 in 1,500. Um, you know, there are a lot of issues that kind of backdate this, and it's not solely the university's, um, you know, power to change that. Um, but but the, this whole idea of escape is something that I kind of have an issue with. Um, and, you know, you get here, you're expected to maybe like conform to certain values um, and that, you know, you come here and you kind of maybe have wasted your education if you're not going on to these big, high, top paying jobs, um, particularly in the city. Um, I think the idea that, you know, plucking students from the community um, and just leaving that community behind once they've made it to Cambridge um, is, is wasting that education a little bit. Um, because we ought to be uplifting um, those communities from which we come. And at the moment, I don't feel that, that there are certainly people, um, as Bobby was saying, you know, who are making a difference. But um, at the moment, the, the owner should not solely be on them. It should be on pe everyone who comes to these universities. The government, you know, about 50% of the cabinet ministers were Oxbridge educated, but I'm yet to see what they are doing for the benefit of the many. Um, as, again, some issues that Bobby has pointed out. You know, along other issues aside and things like that, um, as so long as the dominance of these universities continue in, in UK life, um, I, I think that they are still failing the, the country as a whole, so long as we are not putting our education to use as we ought to be. Thanks. Thank you very much for that point. Um, does anyone want to speak in opposition to the motion at all? Um, Richard. Richard Parkinson, Students College, again. Whether Oxbridge has or has not failed Britain, we first of all have to agree, as our first speaker pointed out, about what Oxbridge is supposed to do. Now, since I'm also a mathematician, I shall start off with some history. The Oxford and Cambridge Colleges were founded as communications, communities consisting of a master, fellows, and scholars, and their purpose was research, not educating undergraduates. They had to educate a few undergraduates, the scholars, because otherwise they weren't going to have anybody to do with the research. So if we're going to judge Oxford and Cambridge on the basis of what they were set up for and what the original people who founded the colleges and gave them all the money wanted them to do, we have to judge ourselves on research. Well, I don't think there's honestly any argument about that. Cambridge and Oxford between them have more Nobel Prize winners than I think any 10 other universities. So we're certainly doing the research, so we're not failing. Does anyone have a point in abstention? I'm also looking up at the gallery. Perfect, I'll go to the person at the back there. Um, I kind of uh, want to abstain on this question because I also, like one of the speakers in proposition, bizarrely think this is completely the wrong question. The idea that Oxbridge can fail Britain. By the time we get to Oxbridge as undergraduates, it's already too late. And there is a complete obsession in this country 
about universities when we should be spending money and far more money on um, primary education and secondary education. Um, thanks to the fees policy that might be unpopular, actually the university system's in a very good state at the moment. We have a world-class university system that has had increased funding. But at the same time, primary education, secondary education has had its funding cut. So I think that we really, really, really should answer the correct question, which is how we can serve our children properly, and that's by getting in early. And yes, the um, Oxbridge has a role to play there, but Oxbridge does have um, the bigger access programs. Oxbridge, Oxford spends six million pounds a year um, already, and, and, and that, that produces a lot of um, good things. But um, I think the main point is that we need to concentrate far more on primary and secondary education, rather than endlessly going on about two universities or the university system, by which time it's far too late. Thank you. Thank you for those three floor speeches. Um, you, the rest of you guys, you've got, I know there are a few hands up to speak um, on all three points. So we'll come back round to you after we've had the next round of main debate speeches. So get ready for that. Um, we move on back to the main debate and uh, we move on to Molly, um, Molly Boulding. Uh, Molly is a first year English student at Sydney, Sussex. She matriculated uh, a week or so ago and she's won this slot via Open Audition, which is a great new initiative we're trialing. I think the next Open Auditions will be on Monday, so watch out on your emails for that, for the Me Too debate. Molly, the floor is yours. Okay, let's give this a go. So, Oxbridge, the portmanteau heads of academic prowess in Britain globally renowned for their unique teaching methods and proud historic traditions. Preempting the Aztec civilization, channeling some of the greatest minds, breakthroughs and achievements in human history, and heralding the advent of education in this proud nation, there's a reputation to behold that seems as solid as the stones that make up this beautiful union building. However, in the words of failed Cambridge applicant and prolific best-selling author Edward Rutherford, all empires become arrogant. It is their nature. And I would propose that this 922-year-old academic empire has done just that. Dr. Stefan Colini, a professor of English literature and intellectual history here at this venerable establishment, puts it best for me, as the sleepy monopoly of and subsequent obsession with Oxford and Cambridge, fed by elitism, the paternalist attempt by some to dictate to others what they ought to want. I imagine for most of the women in this room, that concept may feel disturbingly familiar. Um, his final summation on the demand placed on universities in a time where they have come to be viewed as businesses rather than as educational providers is short but sour. They have to be original, but in the right way. Oxbridge may be original in the sense that it kind of was the original, uh, but becoming successively so exclusive that your reputation is act actively discouraging young people to apply is not original. It is short-sighted, and the cost is to us, not as a society, but as a country, and as a populace in dire need of innovators and problem solvers against the ever-mounting issues of modern society. The housing crisis, the food bank tragedy, the Russian involvement, the current president of the United States, that one doesn't even need a depressing noun phrase, it already is one. Um, given that Oxbridge has a combined estimated worth of over 21 billion pounds, and in 2014 still took twice as many people from Eton as it did from free school meals backgrounds, who I feel compelled to point out make up less than 1% of Oxbridge admissions. The embarrassment that is the Oxbridge admission statistics could and should be added to that list. Now, before I hear any cries of the Oxbridge bashing bandwagon, I would like to acknowledge the words of another Cambridge English professor, Dr. Priyam Vada Gopal who stated in an article for The Guardian that all the huffing and puffing about Oxbridge is destined to remain a yearly ritual. And to an extent, she is right. This is not the first time this problem has been talked about in this tone, and it won't be the last. However, surely the longevity of this topic is a symptom of its ongoing significance and severity, and a lack of genuine engagement from both of these universities must draw at least partial blame. However, before I go any further, as I am an English student, I would first like to query the question. What defines failure? What context does this motion exist within? 
And how does this all relate to a grand scale national picture? Because in order to fail, surely you must first have a goal or an ambition. So before we can look at the supposed failure of these institutions, we first have to acknowledge their purpose. Interestingly enough, whilst the records of an initial teaching, uh, the initial creation of a teaching environment in 1096 demonstrates education as Oxford's primary raison d'etre, the reason Oxford the University was ever physically constructed in the first place was simply to protect students from townsfolk rioting over their perceived parasitic presence in the city. Given the way students were known to behave in this period, and sometimes do still today, that's hardly surprising. Um, nonetheless, speeding up the timeline a little, uh, a modern Oxford cites in its mission statement, among other things, the goal of being recognized as delivering world-class facilities that support world-class research, teaching, and learning. Well, you might say, in many aspects of this, they must be succeeding, and indeed they are. But I would argue that this is actually where they fall down. It's not that they're failing in their goal, it's that they have the wrong one. By this, I mean that Oxford, or indeed Cambridge, is no doubt delivering on every single one of their didactic or intellectual promises, and, but they're not sufficiently indebting themselves to students and to the people of Britain as a whole, who stand to gain the most from significantly more effective access and inclusion policy. Allow me, if you will, to give you an example. I am from a working class family. My mum went to Bristol University and now works for my local city council as an education welfare officer. And my dad won the silver axe at his passing out parade in the fire service and now works as a watch manager in Plymouth. And they both work ridiculously hard to provide for my sister and I. I went to a tiny rural primary school of 60 kids for six years and my local state comprehensive for seven. The college I went to was in special measures until the year after I started. I have been a passionately nerdy child since before I can remember. And the idea of making it to one of the most prestigious universities in the world was a pipe dream I believed in with a ferocity that had to be seen to be believed. I have worked in a local cafe since I was 14 years old, saving every penny of every tip to make it to this moment, and got another job over this summer when I realized that what I had still might not be enough. After a nail-biting 15 hours on results day, having missed just one grade from my offer from Trinity College and thinking I had lost everything I had worked for, it was only a phone call from the Sydney Sussex Director of Admissions and English that saved my dream. I have got my place through blood, sweat, and an incredible amount of tears, and access and inclusion at this university is very close to my heart. More importantly, access to Oxford and Cambridge should not feel so impossible. Access to Oxford and Cambridge should needs to manifest as more than a tokenistic school trip to show off the architecture at King's and the sports facilities at Downing. Not that they're spectacularly beautiful and brilliant in their own ways. Some of my closest friends from school were far cleverer and far more innovative than me. But the idea of applying to Oxbridge was one that students at my school didn't engage with. Not out of a view that, uh, not out of a view they couldn't make it here, but if they did, there was no way they were ever going to feel welcome. Access to these universities needs to manifest in ways that create genuine opportunities for students who would otherwise never consider applying to Oxbridge. And once they're here, and this is the important point for me, make pragmatically inclusive change to policy to welcome students like myself. Dispensing of the undeniably residual classist view and recognizing the value of an experience of life where the clothes on your back and your next meal cannot be taken for granted. In the words of Alan Rusbridger, principal of Lady Margaret Hall at Oxford, who sums up neatly what I'm trying to say, Oxford is undeniably missing out on talent. It rightly wants to find the best, but it's struggling to find them all, unless you believe that the best uniquely resides within the top 20% band of the socioeconomically better off. To illustrate his point, just remember that 40% of admissions at Oxford are from private schools, while just 6.5% of UK students actually attend them. Part of the reason I auditioned for this debate tonight was to have a platform to bring some of my experiences to you all and to give you a view on the world that is somewhat distinct and distant from the privilege that seems to haunt so many of these debates. Now, I have focused largely on the problem of getting into these universities. I think on this issue it's even more important to focus on what students are trying to get out of them. I would need to borrow several people from the audience to have enough hands to count how many times I was told during my application just to suck it up that it was Cambridge, and I was going to get far more out of it than I was at any other university, and it didn't matter whether I enjoyed my three years or not. Or about the many mansions worth of doors I would be opening for myself for just getting an interview. It's common vernacular, put best by Phil McDuff, 
that an Oxbridge degree is a passport to the, the upper echelons of British power and public life, as quantifiably illustrated by the 42 prime ministers who have been produced by them. And like a British passport, an Oxbridge degree is increasingly valuable in the modern world, and increasingly difficult to get hold of, due either to cost or bureaucracy. If we are to put so much value on the Oxbridge degree, to fundamentally prize it above all others from all other universities, we must first allow it to become accessible and enjoyable for students for all backgrounds to study for them. I completely appreciate that these universities seek to maintain their academic pre prestige by recruiting the best and the brightest, the keenest minds and the most out-of-the-box thinkers. And that is essential. But these qualities are not best represented by A-level grades. And whilst the application process does indeed take other factors into consideration, all of these other factors are underpinned by the same characteristics required to achieve exceptional, exceptional A-level grades. It is almost plainly fact that those students who have access to more innovative teaching, more experienced staff, who understand the Oxbridge application system, and who come from a cohort of students where Oxbridge applications are normalized, if not expected, stand a far better chance of gaining a place than those who come from rural, low university progression, low income areas like I do. The reason I have quoted so many people this evening, aside from the fact that they're all far more articulate than intelligent than me, is because most of them are currently serving in capacity as professors or fellows at Oxbridge colleges, or research writers on the topic. Particularly from the professors, it demonstrates a level of introspectiveness. That they are willing to question and critique a system they have benefited so much from. And similar can be said of the union for hosting this motion. However, it also surely shows how clear and pervasive the problem of external access and internal inclusion really is, and why it's more important than ever to genuinely engage with bringing down this exclusive educational hierarchy. As a final quotation from the famous John Keynes, we risk shutting off the sun and stars because they do not pay a dividend. If you're not sure who he is, ask your friendly neighborhood economic student. To lose the brilliance of any students who are fully capable of making it here and making the best of it here is a tragedy and is frankly unforgivable. And if Oxbridge continues to maintain an attitude and a provision, that means 40% of state school teachers will never recommend even their best achieving pupils to apply, as found by a 2016 survey. That will be the outcome. They will never truly really have a cross-sectional set of students equally capable of producing massively beneficial research and writing, and more importantly, bringing with them a spectrum of life experiences and worldviews. This actively disadvantages students from all backgrounds. It actively disadvantages our medical, financial, charitable, and educational capacities as a country. In an ironically appropriate sort of a way, it actively disadvantages these institutions, blinkering them to a view that disproportionately caters to cisgender, heterosexual, able-bodied, wealthy white men. This is not what the Britain of today looks like, and it should not be what the Oxbridge of today looks like either. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Molly. Um, we move on now to our fourth speaker, uh, Councillor Promise Knight. Uh, Promise is a Labour councillor and founder of the Promise Foundation, an organisation seeking to promote diversity at Oxbridge. Uh, we were lucky enough to have 16 uh, pupils who are involved with that foundation up here earlier today, um, and it was a really exciting and, and really engaging experience, hopefully, definitely for me, um, and hopefully for uh, those participants as well. Um, she matriculated at St. Cat's in 2007. Promise, the floor's yours. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. My name is Promise. Um, I have grown to love it. But it's a West African trick, I believe, parents like to play on their children by giving them names of great responsibility, um, like hope, comfort, faith, blessing, peace, to which they have to live up or fail miserably. So in honor of this much needed debate and the grand, grand surroundings of this union, I'd like to share a little about my journey. So I'd like you to indulge me for a moment. I'd like you to go back to your first day here at Cambridge, the arrival who are you with? How are you feeling? 
And most importantly, what can you see? Now imagine this. Arriving at college a week before everybody else to take part in an introductory learning program. Because of no fault of your own, you are so far behind academically and perhaps socially. Imagine have, having to navigate the journey without parental input or concern. And lastly, your arrival is met by a compounded sense of imposter syndrome. The quaint infrastructure reverberates with the sound of everything else but belongingness. This was my experience, an experience birthed out of a difficult home environment, one riddled with overcrowded social housing, fuel poverty, beginning primary education with English as an additional language. I was abandoned, unfortunately, to my own devices, both socially and economically at 16, when I became estranged from my parents. My perspective being tied to a bitter reality never recalled a happy moment at home since the age of consciousness. My journey from a bog-standard comprehensive school in northwest London to Cats was crippled with shocking statistics. According to Poverty Action Group, a third of young people from disadvantaged backgrounds with similar GCSEs to their better-off classmates are more likely to drop out of education at 16. And yes, although we are all too familiar with the issue of socio-economic and regional diversity at Oxbridge, I am certainly not here tonight to defend Oxbridge's record or certainly Cambridge's record on access. Whilst I agree that being in an environment where you are an extreme minority often pits you against a level of ignorance that renders one self-conscious and highly visible, I don't entirely accept the argument that my university, inclusive of the college at which hope and the audacity to dream were restored, is both a symptom and a cause of segregation in Britain. Away from the rounds of political and media-driven confronta confrontations is the key issue of parental input. From my experience and that of our charity, we find that there is a greater need to show parents the benefits of their involvement in their children's education. Fortunately, or unfortunately for me, I was ambushed by many people to apply to Cambridge. My mentor, Camilla Lewis, who despite having four children, took an interest in my education and supported me. Therefore, we need to demystify the education, educational participation. The message has to be clear. This is not a privilege for sharp-elbowed middle-class parents, although I've benefited from a number of those, but an essential component to modern existence. We need to provide a route, a route that is not solely based on behavior modification, but a sense of collective participation. In closing, my family hails from the eastern region of Nigeria. I come from the mighty Igbo tribe who pride themselves on wise and memorable saying. An Igbo proverb says, one seed alone will not produce a harvest. My story alone is not sufficient for a harvest, no not even in this wonderful university. However, I am convinced that as a critical friend from this side of the bench, I can implore Cambridge to consider their inherent and social political duty to social mobility in Britain. 
by better serving young people from deprived backgrounds through broadening their access program to include parents. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for that promise. Um, we're going to move now on to a, another round of floor speeches. So get your hands ready uh, when I come round to you. Uh, does anyone want to speak in proposition of the motion? Anyone in proposition of the motion at all? Anyone think that Oxbridge? Well, oh, yeah, sorry. Thanks. Uh, Owen McArdle, St. Catherine's College. Um, now, I want to take a slightly different spin on this question and ask, really, is it a good thing that we have two universities that are placed so high above the rest, um, and two universities in the southeast of England, because regional inequality is a real bugbear of mine, um, and I think that Oxbridge, as a sort of institution, is something that, well, it draws people from various regions of the UK, not enough of them, that's a different issue. And many of them never leave the southeast, and that is failing Britain. Now there is another way. I've uh, just come back from studying in Germany, in the south of Germany, and I can count on one hand, well probably one finger, the number of people that I met from the north of Germany. Is there any sort of mumbling in the corridors of Stuttgart or Berlin about this? No, not a peep. Nobody cares. And why don't they care? Because there are good universities in every part of the country. People can go to their local university. They know that the education they get in their local university is as good as they would get in any other university in Germany. And then at the end, they will be able to get a job in their local area. Now. I know that it's been raised, um, the number of universities the UK has in the top 10, the top 50. I imagine, I don't know, I imagine Germany has a lot fewer. But I tell you what, I'd have their economy over hours every day of the week and twice on Sundays. Would anyone like to speak in opposition of the motion at all? Anyone want to speak in opposition? Hands up. No. Empty. Oh, up there. Um, yeah. Sorry, we're going to need to race the microphone around. Cheers, Adam. <laughs> um, Bodhi Harding, Wolfson College. Um, this is a question of failure, um, and I'd like to point out that is Niels Bohr, famous physicist, Rosalind Franklin, all of these amazing people from these institutions, are they failure? Now, there might be a few like bombastic um, PPE people that would tackle Japanese kids somewhere in the world, and that might be perceived as a failure in some places. But I'm from a, a town called Alice Springs in the middle of Australia. That was founded by someone from Cambridge. So I'd just like to say that there are some issues here, but to me and a lot of people around the world, this place is inspiration, it is ambition, and it is everything that we want to be going forward. So I, I would just like to make that note in this argument. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anyone like to abstain? Any points in abstain? Oh, God. That's popular. Um, we'll, we'll go. Uh, that's all right. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Um, Rhiannon, Maria Smith, Mr. Hall. Um, I think the main problem that I have with this debate is that it's kind of equating Oxbridge with higher education itself. Um, I really like Owen's point about regional diversity, and um, that's also a bugbear of mine, as you might be able to tell by the way I speak. Um, basically, like when I came to Cambridge, it was kind of assumed by my entire family that I was leaving the Northwest and that I was never coming back. 
and I am graduating next year and I am dealing with having to tell my mum that I am moving to London and not back to Manchester as she would so love me to do. So one of the things that I just can't get behind in on either side of the debate is that when we come to equate Oxbridge itself with higher education, we're placing it on a pedestal that I think neither side uh, wants to. I think everyone here basically agrees. <laughs> you know, Ox Oxbridge isn't perfect. There's problems in the British education system that are the problem, and it's not Oxbridge itself that's the problem, um, which is why I want to abstain, because I think that um, Oxbridge isn't failing Britain. It's failing... It's failing, I don't know. I can't wrap this up very well. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Rhiannon. Fantastic. Uh, we move on to our final pair of speakers. Um, I'm going to start with Trenton. Trenton Sewell is a second year law student at Christ College. Uh, he is currently one of good debating officers at the Union. You may have also seen him on Tuesday in the Basque debate. Trenton, the floor is yours for the second time in a week. Can everybody hear me? Lovely. The second speaker for the opposition didn't defend the record of accessibility, called it indefensible, and said that there needs to be a change in message. This sounds like a failure to me, a failure of inclusion, a failure to make sure that any aspiration these establishments can provide is available to everyone across this country. I would invite that speaker to cross the floor because I think she's arguing for our side of the house. The, the refrain that opposition uses to defend themselves against this is that it's not Oxbridge that has failed Britain. It, it's just a scapegoat for some more fundamental underlying problem. But I think they missed what John said right from the start of this debate. The path to power in the UK is through Oxbridge. And it creates a groupthink that prevents fundamental problems from being solved. In order to get to power, you need to have attended Oxbridge. Oxbridge picks from elite, wealthy, privileged backgrounds who don't know what it's like to go to school hungry, who don't know what it's like to live in poverty and destitution, who don't know the pain and difficulty that that can create for individuals. And then, when those graduates get into power, when they get to craft what national policy is like, it's no surprise they don't craft national policy that fixes problems of accessibility. It's no surprise that they only perpetuate the problem. So maybe it's true that Oxbridge didn't create it, but Oxbridge and its connection with the establishment perpetuates the problem and prevents it from getting solved. But Oxbridge is getting better. Right? It's changing its admissions program to make sure that it's more accessible. I would contend that whether Oxbridge is getting better is irrelevant to this debate. Right? The debate is Oxbridge has failed. So it might very well be the case that Oxbridge will soon stop failing Britain. That's not the motion you're asked to vote on today. At a university that, is, that had segregated colleges until the 1980s, that still doesn't take in state school students in large numbers, that doesn't take students on free school meals with large numbers, that still doesn't have internally inclusive atmosphere. I think it is beyond dispute that Oxbridge has failed in the past. Then opposition says Oxbridge has done good things. Right? They, they put out amazing research. They're a good educational institute. But we all know that failure is based on expectations, right? You, you fail if you don't reach that which you expect yourself to achieve or that which others expect you to achieve. Why is this important? Because Oxbridge, given how deified it is in this country, 
given the pedestal that it holds in public life and how many of its graduates hold positions of power. I would say that the expectations ought to be astronomically high. It's not enough to occasionally do good things, given how important Oxbridge is. We ought to expect more of it, and to fail those expectations ought to mean that Oxbridge has failed Britain. Yes? How many liberal bodies, how many field bodies, how many metric class do you want? <laughs> Getting lots of Nobel Prizes is nice, but if you don't include disadvantaged communities in getting access to those professors, in getting access to that research, in being able to go to institutions that are the gateways to power, you have failed regardless of how many Nobel Prize accolades you're able to put in your newsletters. The next thing that opposition holds is, is that Oxbridge is a tool of aspiration. I have three responses I want to give to this. First, I'm unclear why Oxbridge needs to be the tool of aspiration. Right? Why is it that you can only aspire, why you can only reach for the stars by targeting two academic institutions? Like, the, the, the mere fact that that is the narrative of education that takes place in this country is one of the reasons why Oxbridge has failed, that it has sucked all of the air out of the room of aspirational discourse. But secondly, I would contend that not only is aspirational thinking possible to other universities, but the fact that Oxbridge is held up as the metric of aspiration makes things worse. And the reason why is that it equates success with an Oxbridge education. It equates having succeeded in your aspirations to getting in to one of these two schools. Which means that when the vast majority of people don't, and the vast, vast majority of underprivileged people don't, they failed. They haven't met their dreams. They didn't achieve their aspirations. Right? The, the fact that aspiration is tied up in Oxbridge means that it's harder for individuals to feel like they've met those aspirations, to feel like they're worthy, to feel like they've succeeded at all in their life. The alternative is, is for aspiration to be more diverse, right? To, to aspire to succeed at a variety of places, in a variety of unique ways. That is far better for this country than aspiration only being achieved by aiming for two schools and nothing else. The third response I want to give to this is, I think the aspiration that, that Oxford and Cambridge create is an aspiration to a certain kind of success. It's an aspiration to an academic success, to a success of becoming a consultant or working in a top office in a law firm. That's not success. Right? That might be some people's conception of success, but you can succeed in other ways. Right? The fact that our culture increasingly thinks that success is being amazing at getting a high job, high paying job in a capitalist system is part of the problem because it tells people that don't want that, that they can't succeed. To tell people who can't achieve that, that they can't succeed. And pushes people who could live a meaningful, happy, and fulfilled life in other ways, down a path that leads to mental health crises in a lot of cases, down a path that only makes their life worse. So I think that tying aspiration into Oxbridge is actually a problem, not a reason why Oxbridge hasn't failed Britain. So why has Oxbridge failed? Firstly, it effectively creates a club of wealth and privilege. The admissions process doesn't adequately take into account the disadvantage in people's backgrounds, whether it be based on class or whether it be based on race. And once you're here, you deal with a different form of discrimination, uh, where you don't know what cutlery to take first, where you feel uncomfortable in the rituals that are often the rituals of the elite in society that don't adequately include individuals from worst-off backgrounds. 
But Oxbridge has also failed Britain because of the creation of groupthink. Because if everyone thinks the same way, has been educated the same way, comes from the same backgrounds when they get into halls of power, it's difficult to think differently, to think in innovative and unique ways. But that kind of innovative thinking, this kind of cognitive diversity, is what's critical to improve the lot of a nation. Right? If you don't have people from a wide variety of backgrounds, it's difficult to craft national policy for the benefit of the entirety of the nation state. But because Oxbridge lacks that diversity, and it is the gatekeeper to power in this country, it's failed the nation. But third, it blocks out other metrics of success, and it cannibalizes discourse around universities and success to only be about Oxbridge. We've got no response from opposition to a lot of what John said in his first speech about how discussions about accessibility only end up being discussions about Oxbridge, meaning that the rest of the university system in the UK, which also has issues, doesn't get addressed either. That you change the discourse around success to only be about Oxbridge in a way that, that's harmful. If you're going to take one thing away from my speech, it doesn't matter if Oxbridge has done some good things. right? It doesn't matter if Oxbridge is getting better. What matters is what it has done and the ways in which it has failed. Failed at inclusion. Failed at adequate education beyond just being able to make a clever argument in a supervision session. Failed at actually improving the lot of this country because it creates groupthink within the halls of power. Any institutions that have done all of these things have obviously failed. Proud to propose. Thank you very much, Trenton. Um, we move on now to our final speaker in tonight's debate, uh, Lord Chris Smith. Uh, Lord Chris Smith was first elected to Parliament in 1983. Uh, he was the first openly gay MP, uh, as well as the first openly gay cabinet minister, serving as culture secretary in Tony Blair's first cabinet. Uh, he matriculated at Pembroke College, uh, Cambridge, in 1970, and is now its present master. So he's gone from matriculate up to master in a matter of years. Um, he's also the chair of trustees here at the union. So we're all very grateful for him coming and speaking today. Lord Chris, the floor is yours. <laughs> Well, Mr. President, uh, I will uh, begin by congratulating you on uh, taking this uh, uh, august chair that, uh, uh, that you have now reached. Um, the thing you didn't include in my biography was that I was president of the Union, much more important than being Master of Pembroke. <laughs> um, there, um, uh, uh, the late, great Adlai Stevenson uh, candidate uh, for the Democratic Party for the United States uh, presidency uh, many, many years ago, uh, gave a barnstorming speech at the Democratic Convention. And at the end of it, as all the chairs were being moved away, uh, an elderly lady came up to him and she said, uh, Governor Stevenson, after that speech, every thinking person in America is going to vote for you. And he looked sadly at her and said, ma'am, I'm afraid I need a majority. <laughs> um, I will, however, not face the same problem here uh, this evening. Now, in one respect, I uh, have to admit the proposition tonight are absolutely right. There is one group of people I have to say from Oxford, not from Cambridge. Uh, there is one group of people uh, who, uh, partly because of their time at Oxford, have comprehensively failed Britain. They gave us Brexit. And they are David Cameron, George Osborne, Boris Johnson, and Michael Gove. Um, to that extent, in some 
cases, yes, there is an elite. There are people who've come through the Oxbridge system. They have formed some sort of groupthink uh, mentality. So, yes, there are, there are shreds of, uh, of an argument there. But to imply that that applies to the entirety of Oxbridge is, I believe, fundamentally flawed. Um, the uh, proposition have uh, uh, airily dismissed the point that has been made several times from the floor about uh, the record on Nobel Prizes. Now, just take Cambridge. I will give you the figures. In the last 114 years, since Nobel Prizes were first awarded in 1904, Cambridge has been awarded 107 Nobel Prizes. They have included prizes for the discovery of argon, the discovery of the structure of the atom, the discovery of the neutron, the discovery of penicillin, the writing of the history of Western philosophy, the discovery of the structure of DNA, the structure of compounds to fight anemia, and uh, the science of welfare economics. And most recently, just last week, Greg Winter of Trinity, a uh, Nobel Prize for the display of peptides and antibodies. Is that a record of failure? And then you know, we were told, oh, that's all right, because uh, it's all about people becoming uh, the heads of city law firms and going into slick city jobs. Well, Newton, Darwin, David Attenborough, from Edmund Spencer to Milton to Ted Hughes to Clive James, from Rupert Brooke to Ian McKellen, from John Maynard Keynes to Alan Turing, these are not slick city people. They are all people educated at Cambridge who have made a profound contribution to the well-being of Britain and the world. And just take two examples. Uh, uh, the uh, winner of the Fields Medal uh, for Mathematics, the mathematical equivalent of the Nobel Prize, Kurt Schreberker. Uh, he uh, grew up as a uh, 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 it, he grew up in a uh, small holding on the borders of uh, Iraq and Iran. Uh, he's Kurdish. He spent his primary school years living through the Iraq-Iran war which raged around him. He fled as a refugee to Britain. He is now researching and teaching and supervising at Cambridge University. Edward Kamau Braithwaite, the leading poet and literary voice of the Caribbean, studied at Pembroke in the early 1950s. He went on to found and spearhead the Caribbean artists' movement. Any university that can include, welcome, nurture, support, sustain people like Kortcher Berke and Kamau Braithwaite is a university, I would argue, that is certainly not failing Britain. A university that can provide the education, the research base, the exploration of ideas, the life of the mind that has a record such as this is worth admiring. And this actually is the fundamental point here. Do we want to have here in this country, in the field of higher education and research, a real center of excellence? A place that's not about being arrogant, but that is about being aspirational. And it doesn't suck the air out of the rest of the university system, as we've just been uh, 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 told. Of course not. 
Imperial, LSE, UCL, King's College London, Durham, Bristol, Newcastle, Edinburgh. There are fantastic universities around this country. They are doing groundbreaking work. They are admired across the world. But what Oxford and Cambridge represent is something very precious because they represent real centers of excellence. They are places where teaching, research, and thinking are of the very highest world-leading quality. Now, there was a compelling argument from the floor uh, for the abstentions about the failures of primary and secondary education, that we spend too much time concentrating on higher education. We ought to be looking further back down the age spectrum. Absolutely right. We do need to support primary and secondary education in this country far better than we are doing at the moment. One of the problems, one of the struggles that Oxbridge has in broadening participation, in widening access, in drawing in uh, people from uh, less advantaged backgrounds is precisely because the secondary school education system is failing too many kids. Uh, but it's not an either or. We do need to invest in primary and secondary education, but we need to carry on supporting the centers of excellence that we absolutely have here in Oxford and Cambridge. Now, of course, it's important to ensure that these centers of excellence are accessible to the widest possible range of people. It's why access and outreach work is so crucial. It's why we need to encourage and enable students from all parts of the country, from non-private schools, students of color, students from all backgrounds, to come here to Oxbridge. We aren't perfect at this. Uh, we are getting better, yes. And even the proposition admitted we're getting better. Four years ago, 58% state school uh, uh, entrance to Cambridge. Last year, 64%. This year, in Pembroke, 67%. We are improving. And state school, you're about to make the point that the state private um, uh, equation is not the only thing to worry about. Of course it isn't. We're also getting better on the other indicators. The people from the lowest two uh, uh, percentiles of, uh, uh, of economic disadvantage. So things are gradually getting better and resources are being poured into it. We're making progress. We are not doing nearly well enough. Yes, absolutely. The proposition entirely have a point on that. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't destroy the whole thing. Don't denigrate the whole thing just because we are not doing quite enough yet at drawing in the broadest range of people that we possibly can. I want Oxbridge to be about privilege, but it's about the privilege of teaching excellence, of quality of thought and discussion, the privilege of expanding intellectual horizons, of aspirations, of inspiration, not privilege of background or origin or parental provenance. Michelangelo uh, uh, once said, the problem is not that we aim too high and fail. It is that we aim too low and succeed. Oxbridge, 
and what Oxbridge represents as a center of excellence is all about aiming high. And I believe that in this country we do indeed deserve places that aim high, that encourage people to aspire to aim high. And that's why, ultimately, Oxbridge has not and will not fail Britain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you to all our speakers, uh, to John, Molly, uh, Trenton, Bobby, uh, Promise, and, and Chris, who spoke last. Um, and also, thank you to all the stewards and AV, etc. Brilliant job as ever. Just a few points from me uh, before you all head off. Um, once again, a thanks, thank you to OCNC, our sponsors, very generous sponsors for this evening. Um, we're also, uh, we'll also share via our Facebook page links to the Promise Foundation, um, who we were working with earlier today, um, with, for some more information there and then the opportunity to donate to that particular really valuable charitable organization, which Promise heads up. Um, just thought I would refer a few of you to members' discounts. We've negotiated a few more members' discounts this week. So, uh, Nana Mexico, you get your five pound uh, Monday on a Sunday if you're a union member as well. So, if you want to have two in a row. Um, we've also got one at Jack's Auto, probably the wrong time of year for that. Um, and Guardies as well. So, 10% off at Guardies if you're, you know, if, you're, if you're a union member. So, I just thought I would remind you about all of those in case it's something we don't really publicize enough. So, I thought I'd let you know about those. We also have Tony Schwartz speaking tomorrow, so Trump's ghostwriter, the person who wrote the article deal for Trump, the person who knows Trump the best, apparently. Well, that's what he says. Um, so he'll be talking to us tomorrow at 7 or 7.30. You can check the Facebook event. In terms of what we do from now, at the Union we vote with our feet. Um, as you can see, there's uh, a doorway, there are three doors. The door on the left, as I'm looking at it, is for the nose, the door on the right is for the eyes, and the middle one's for the abstentions. Uh, the results will be announced in the bar afterwards. Do stay around and have a chat. The motion before the house is this house believes Oxbridge has failed Britain. Good night. <laughs>